Welcome to Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. This program is sponsored by some area churches of Christ and is dedicated to spreading the everlasting gospel as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. The churches of Christ accept the Scriptures as totally inspired of God and the all-sufficient guide for faith and practice. Therefore, they reject all doctrines of men and rely totally on the Bible to direct their course in serving God. It is our pledge to you that each lesson will be the truth as revealed in His Holy Word. Mr. Barnett carefully prepares the graphics so you can clearly see the book, chapter, and verse of each lesson taught. We urge you to either copy the scriptures used or record this program for further study. If you have any questions or comments, or if you need prayer, the Seeking the Lost ministry can be reached toll-free at 1-800-390-7734. It is our prayer that Seeking the Lost will be an important source of information about God's Word and will help you more perfectly worship Him. And now, here is Mr. Barnett. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to the Seeking the Lost broadcast. I hope you have your Bible and study along with me, or if you would like, you can record it to play it back some other time. But I want to talk to you today about an interesting subject that sometimes goes unnoticed, and yet people teach it and believe it and, and preach it. And so let's see what we got. We're going to be talking about predestination and unconditional election. This is one and the same. Sometimes it's called unconditional election. Sometimes it's just called predestination. I'd like for us to study that. And the first question, of course, that we need to answer, what is predestination? Predestination is that by the eternal decree of God, he decided before the foundation of the world what was to become of each and every individual. That's what predestination is talking about. In other words, before the world was made, each person was consigned either to heaven or hell, no matter what they did. You think about that now. That is what is predestination. Sometimes it's referred to as Calvinism. And this is just one part of Calvinism. And uh, we'll talk about some of the others later. But look here. When you think about this, did God before the creation of the world make an unchangeable master list of those who will be saved and those who will go to hell? Did he do that? There are many people who believe that he did, but yet the scriptures do not say so. Somebody said you don't believe in predestination. I believe what the Bible says about predestination and he did predestinate things, and he did foreknow things. But he did not do this, that he would make up a list and predetermine and foreknow who was going to heaven or hell and just consign them there arbitrarily. But the Bible does speak about predestination, and we'll talk about it. Think about this. <clears throat> Romans 8 and 9, But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. The Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I want you to notice carefully here that he's talking about people. He is writing to the Romans, and he is speaking in the present tense. He is not talking about the eons and all of the years or the time or the eternities before, I'll get it right in a minute, the eternities before time began on the earth and the beginning of mankind. It's in the present time. But you are not in the flesh. Who was he talking to? He was talking to members of the body of Christ. He's not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you, is God dwelling in you? Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. My friends, he was talking about the present. He wasn't talking about eons before that period or before time began in Genesis 1. He was telling them that if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And think about that. As we go along, no one in eternity past 
had the Spirit of Christ. No one in eternity past had that. But here, let's look at this. For whom he foreknew, he also predestinated. I told you that the scriptures talked about predestination. But not a list that God has made up that he's going to save only these few people. For whom he foreknew, he also predestinated. Now what did he predestinate? Why well, he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's what he predestinated, that they would be conformed to the image of his son. He didn't pick out a fellow and say, you just lost. And another fellow said, you are saved and you will be conformed. No, he's talking about those who obeyed the gospel. He predestined that they would be conformed to the image of his son. You see what I'm talking about? God predestinates that Christians would be like his son. And that's the story of that predestination. That's the story of that passage. Now look at this. Romans, <clears throat> moreover, he did predestinate them he also called. In other words, those that he predestinated, he called them. Now how would he call them? And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Well, how about that? Who did he call? Well, it wasn't just the select, elect few, I can tell you that. The gospel went into all the world. And here's the way they were called. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. Whom he did predestinate, he also called. Predestinating that those people would be like his son. And he called them. Now then, there were those who would accept, there were those who would not accept. But he did not make up a person's mind whether he would or not. He was, he was not reading from a list of the select, elect few. He called them by the gospel. Them he also called. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go again. Look at this. But we all with unveiled face. You remember that the Bible talks about newborn babes in Christ, but well, this is somewhat of a parallel passage. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Who is our great example of how that we ought to pattern our lives? Why is Jesus Christ? And as newborn babes, we desire the sincere milk of the word, and we grow thereby. The, just like looking at, in a mirror, you know, we look in a mirror. I have to look in a mirror to comb my hair and to shave, brush my teeth. And looking in a mirror to improve, you see. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Are being transformed into the same image. Isn't that what that previous passage talked about? From glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. If you don't have the Spirit of the Lord... You can't be saved. And he says here that we change from glory to glory, looking better and better. It's somewhat like a, a lady putting on makeup. You know, sometimes ladies that without a makeup, they don't look so well. But they begin to add a little lipstick and a little rouge and a, something about their eyebrows and their eyelashes. And you turn around. And they have been transformed. And it was from one step to the other. And in our spiritual life, beholding the glory of the Lord, He is our example. We change. We transform ourselves into the same image from glory to glory. doesn't happen all at once. Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now listen. Ephesians 1 and 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You see, we've got to be in Christ and we've got to change ourselves toward the glory of the Lord. Looking at his great example, his life, we begin to change. 
and all spiritual blessings. That does not mean some of them. That means all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen in him before the foundation of the world. If somebody said, well, this is our passage. This is our passage showing that he had chosen from the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, what did he foreordain? He foreordained that we should be holy and without blame when we become a Christian, when we begin to change from glory to glory that we should be holy and without blame. That's what he is providing for us through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see what it's talking about? No time does God mention a list that he is going to save just a few people and the rest of them are just going on to hell. Well, look at this, Ephesians 5 and 6. Having predestinated, I told you the Bible talked about predestination, but what kind is he talking about? What predestination? Here it is. He predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Jesus Christ is our elder brother, so to speak, and we have God the Father. And he has predestined that he is going to adopt us as children by Jesus Christ to himself. That's what he predestinated according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted. How has he made us accepted and worthy of this adoption? In the beloved. And who is the beloved? Well, of course, it's Jesus. Just think about that. The adoption. He's predestined us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. And we have to be in Christ to do that, in the beloved. Now then, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect. Somebody said, I told you there was the select, elect few. Elect according to the knowledge of God and the Father through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Elect, is he talking about that, that list that he has made, that predetermined before the foundation of the world whether you'd be saved or not? No. He's talking about the elect to the knowledge of God the Father. Here it comes. Through the sanctification of the Spirit unto the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's their election there. That their election comes from obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Sprinkling of the blood, that goes back to the time of the law, of course, when they would sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant. But he's talking about the blood of Christ right here. They were elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God knew it was going to be this way. But he's not talking about a single individual to include him or put him out through sanctification. God foreknew that that was what was going to happen. Sanctification of the Spirit through obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Think about this. 2 Thessalonians 2. But we're bound to give thanks always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God chose you from the beginning to be saved. That's right. How was it to be saved? Just like that last passage, through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. What about that person that won't obey? Well, he can't be sanctified by the Spirit and he can't be saved by belief in the truth. Don't you see this? This is what was, sanct this is what was foreknown. This was what predestined that they would be sanctified by the Spirit and by the belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel. How did we get into that? How did God foreknow and say that 
people are going to be saved through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. Why, well, He's going to call you through our gospel. He's going to call you. He's going to make you aware of that and invite you in. Now look at this. One does not get chosen until he believes and obeys the truth. And that goes for all the world. We are not chosen in eternity past, as it is being taught, because these things we read from the apostles Peter and Paul was happening in the present, not in eternity past. They were being sanctified then. They were being saved then for their belief. You see, not in eternity past. Now then, what did God predestinate? Just put it in the capsule here. Everyone who obeyed would be saved by the blood of Christ. He predest that was predestinated. That was going to be. He also, the saved, would be conformed to the image of Christ. You remember looking as in a mirror that we try to implement and to copy what the Lord stood for and how he lived? Be conformed to the image of the saved would be, would be sanctified by the blood of Christ. He predestinated that. And also think about this. Those in Christ would be holy and without blame. And another thing. In Christ the saved would be adopted as children. What do you think about that? That's what he predestinated. He didn't pick out a certain individual to receive this blessing. But the gospel is for all. They would be called by the gospel. Not some ancient list. They wouldn't get up there and make a roll call in each generation to see if he was on the list. That's not happening. But they would be called by the gospel. If Jesus were a Calvinist, what would this read? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I think it would read like this. Come unto me, all ye who are the elect from eternity past. Jesus is not a Calvinist. This is the way it reads. Notice this. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. If Jesus were a Calvinist, he'd probably put it this way. The Son of Man has come to save only the elect which was lost. I don't think that's the way it reads, do you? If Jesus were a Calvinist, John 3:16, one of the most beloved passages. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever... Is he on the list? Whosoever believeth in him. If he were a Calvinist, Jesus would have said that whosoever of the elect believeth in him. Others, just hell bound, just go on to hell. That's not the way the book reads. Think about this. John 3, 37. Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Any man... Think about that. If Jesus were a Calvinist, he would have said, If any man of the elect thirst, let him come to me. The non-elect cannot drink. Not welcome. What about this? I am the door. By me, if any man. Does that sound like they select, elect few, the list that is unchangeable? Any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. If he were a Calvinist, he would have said, I am the door. If any of the elect enter in, the none elect, on the other hand, not welcome. John eleven twenty six, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. If he were a Calvinist, he would have said, And whosoever of the elect liveth and believeth in me, shall never die. The rest is just going to hell. If Jesus were a Calvinist, what do you think this would read? And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Holy Spirit, the Bride, that's the church. And let him that heareth say, Come. And him that is a thirst, Come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water freely. If John, who wrote the book through the revelation of Jesus Christ, if he were a Calvinist, 
he would have said, and whosoever is of the elect only. He didn't say that. Whosoever will. Just think about these things. All does not mean some. Look at these passages. John 12. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw how many? All men, not just a select, a like few. John 13. By this, all men, not just a select, a few, shall know that ye are my disciples if you love one another. All men. Think about that. Here's another. Acts 17, 23. At the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded how many? All men everywhere to be saved. You can't get away from that. <clears throat> because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, whereof he has given assurance unto how many? All men. In that he hath raised him from the dead. Look at this passage. And so death passed upon how many? All men. Not just a few. For that all have sinned. Death passed upon everybody. Look at this. 1 Timothy 2. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved. All does not mean some. He would have all men to be saved. It's time that people looked at that doctrine. Well, okay, how are we going to be saved? Here is a person that was a jailer. You remember the Apostle Paul was thrown into prison, Paul and Silas. And at midnight they sang a song and prayed. And the prison was shaken. And all the doors were thrown open. And the jailer, thinking everybody had escaped, why well, he said, I've got to commit suicide because I am here and I'm responsible for these prisoners. They'll take my life for theirs. Paul cried out with a loud voice and said, Hey, wait a minute. We're all here. And he, trembling, came in and asked this important question. Remember, he is not a Christian. He is not a Jew. So he'd know anything about the scriptures. He is a Gentile. He came in, brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So what is the Apostle Paul going to answer a man that's never heard the gospel? Why, he said, first of all, you've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're talking about to you, those of you that want to be saved. If you don't know about Jesus Christ, then you're going to have to be like this Philippian jailer. Now, what about him? You're going to have to believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the next passage say, and Paul preached unto him so that he could believe. And so here's a person out here that he's lost. He's not a Christian. He wants to be saved. And he asks, and Paul tells him the first thing, you've got to believe. And then he preached to him so that he could. Okay, here I am a believer in Jesus Christ because I've looked at the record. What am I to do now? Well, here are a group of people that are believers too. The Apostle Peter had just announced to them on the day of Pentecost saying that God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That struck to their hearts. And when I heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Hence, we know that they believed. And Paul, had, I mean, Peter had preached to them, and they believed. Peter said unto them, and answered that question, Well, repent and be baptized. How many of you, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins? And so, for a person who believes the next thing that he needs to do is to repent. Well, do we have an example in the Bible about a penitent believer and what he actually did we have? Let's look at this right here. What should a penitent believer do? The eunuch said, see, here is water. 
What would hinder me to be baptized? All of you know the story of Philip and the eunuch, don't you? And he says, here's water. What's keeping me from being baptized? You see, Philip got up in that chariot, and he began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus Christ. So you ask yourself, well, did he mention baptism? Of course he did, because here the eunuch actually asked to be baptized. And he is certainly a penitent believer. He was a penitent person before he even believed in Christ. Why? He'd been on his way to Jerusalem. He had ridden a wagon all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. A chariot. All, can you imagine how bumpy that thing would be? He had ridden it all the way up there to worship, and he was returning. And the eunuch said, so I know that he was a penitent, and he was a believer in God. And now, are you a believer in Christ? He said, here's water. What's keeping me from being baptized? And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So there you have it. Here's a person that does not believe. He's taught that he does believe. And then, of course, he's told to repent of his sins. And a penitent believer, we find here an example that he confessed the name of the Lord Jesus, which Jesus said, if you'll confess me before man, I'll confess you before the Father, which is in heaven. And so here we go. And then, what must I do to be saved? <clears throat> Everyone must be baptized. And he said unto them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and, oh, something else, Lord, and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. You are not predestined. You make up your own mind. You look at the scriptures and you determine if you really do believe that Jesus existed on this earth and that he was the son of God. Don't you see? That's how we get into Christ. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. That's what we urge upon you, to make your calling, your call by the gospel. And you're elected all right, but it's not a mysterious list of long ago but it's your obedience and your willingness to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching the Seek and the Lost broadcast. Our robot is saying you have a good day. Our God is an awesome God. You have been watching Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. If you need prayer or have comments or questions, feel free to call the Seeking the Lost ministry at 1-800-390-7734. That's toll-free, 1-800-390-7734. Seeking the Lost is sponsored each week by some area churches of Christ. Until next time, may the good Lord bless you and keep you.